We continue this morning building on what we've looked at the last two weeks. Two weeks ago, we looked at the prophet Malachi, particularly verse 11, for from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will, will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. We saw how God's glory, His greatness would be known throughout the world. And if that is true, then we ask the question, are we giving God the honor that He deserves as our Master, as our Father? And then last week we were in the prophet Zechariah and chapter 4, particularly verse 6, where uh, the prophet says uh, through the angel, the vision that he received, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so this work that God has called us to of making His glory known is something that is accomplished through His own power, through His strength, not our own. And really these, these two big pictures of God's glory, God's power, they present to us a big God. And we can think that this, these big picture realities about God, and we can look about those and stand back in, in, in amazement at how great God truly is. Be in awe of His greatness. And then we can turn our thoughts to our own lives. And in our lives in comparison to the greatness of God seem so small, right? We think about how brief our life is how it appears inconsequential in the big scheme of things, right? And we can say, I'm, I'm glad to be alive. I'm trying to do my best with the life that I have. But at the end of the day, there really doesn't seem to be any big pictureness to my own life. But the reality is God calls us to live our lives in the midst of His big picture. He gives us His life. And then He calls us and enables us to live our lives in a certain way. To be connected to and focus our lives on something that is of immense value. And so there is a big picture to our life, not because there's anything big picture about us, but because the God who is, has great glory from the rising of the sun to its setting, His name will be declared as great. And that will be accomplished not by human strength or human power, but by His own Spirit working. And God, that God has invited us into His work. And so we are not living some small little existence in the earth. This morning... Given what we've seen over the last two weeks of God's glory and God's greatness, I want this morning to look at the big picture of the focus of our own life. And it's there probably in the, the verse out that, that Jake read for us, the verse that you probably know there in verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. That verse is really the main point that Jesus is trying to get across there in that section that was just read. Here is Jesus this morning from this passage saying, as gently and as lovingly, but as so clearly, He says, Christian, here is to be the focus of your life. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And in that, there is an implied warning to not let anything else distract you from that main focus. Don't get caught up in living for anything else besides the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now, there are two ways that we could understand that particular instruction. Right? There's a wrong way, I believe, and then there is a right way that I'm going to argue how we ought to view it. The wrong way first is that when Jesus says, first, seek first the kingdom of God, that He simply means that you should make sure that God is at the top of your list. If you're ranking your priorities, God's number one. Uno, they're at the top. And as long as God is first then we sort of have the freedom to allow all sorts of other things to have a life of their own in our lives. 
right? But we know that's not true because there in verse 24 of chapter 6 here in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You can't say, well, I'm going to serve God first, and then I'm going to serve money second. He said, no, no, that doesn't work. You've got to have one master, not two, and sort of ranking them in priority. That's not his point. It's not just a matter of priority when it comes to our lives and seeking first the kingdom of God. It is a matter of control. It's not just having God as sort of the top of your list. It's having God control and be served by everything that is on your list. See, nothing in the Christian life is free to have a life of its own because everything in our life is to be under the lordship, the rule, the reign of Christ. And so either you will live your life devoted to living for this earthly kingdom, the here and the now. You will live a life devoted to your security, your comfort, your status. And God is sort of this powerful bellboy, this powerful genie, who thankfully exists to come in and help you serve pursuing what you're about. God serves to help you build your earthly kingdom. Or... We live a life devoted to God and His purposes. And the focus of our life and everything in our life exists to consistently and purposefully serve His agenda and His kingdom. So when we think about our work, we think about our relationships, our time, our wealth, in everything that is connected to our life, it is in the undisputed service to Christ. So, there are many parts to living the Christian life. There are our personal devotion to God. There's our being part of a a church community, a community of believers. There are moral obedience, this Christian ethic that's taught in the Scripture. There's our witness in the world. There's our living faithfully as Christians in the day-to-day actions of our life. And all of those things, all of those parts of living the Christian life, all of these responsibilities that we have in our relationships and in our money and our time, all of those things are to be organized under and unified by this one controlling focus. Everything is to be directed towards seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. So that's really the main idea here of the sermon We are to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness in everything that we do. So, with that main idea in your mind, what does it specifically mean? I want to bring out two particular truths, a negative and a positive, to help us understand and think through the implication of that idea. First of all, the main competitor to living for God's kingdom or the main competitor to to pursuing what's good for God's kingdom, the main competitor to that is living for our own comfort, our own security, our own position in the kingdom of this world. So if we are to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, the main competitor for us doing so is that we will seek our own comfort, our own financial security, our own kingdom instead of the Lord's. And everyone here this morning and everyone that's paying attention through our technology here, we need to acknowledge that this is a strong competitor in every one of our hearts. Worldly comfort, worldly success... Worldly attainment has a strong pull on our lives, and that pull never stops. It's always there. The spell of materialism and financial security is a hard spell to break. And that threat can be felt in one or two different ways based on the passage that Jake read for us a few moments ago. And both of those pulls are powerful upon us. First of all, it can be felt in the form of simple, raw desire. Right? We want things. 
I want to lay up treasures for myself on earth. That's, that's what our heart longs for, right? And so when Jesus says there in verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. He has to say that because that's what we want to do. We want to use our life to lay up those treasures, and we want God to help us accomplish that goal. That's when He's serving as our personal genie, but that's not what God's about. God doesn't exist to help us lay up treasures on earth. That's not what He's about, and that's not what He wants His people to be about. There in verse 24, as we read other, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and lay up treasures for yourself on earth. You can't do that. It doesn't work. So here we speak of the possibility, there in verse 24, of loving money and what money can buy for us, the security, the comforts. And so Jesus is saying, look, you can lose your focus upon seeking my kingdom. You can lose your focus on that by a misguided desire. A desire for your own security, a desire for your own comfort, a desire for your own enjoyment and enjoyable experience in the kingdom of this world. And so however neutral intrinsically possessions may be, becoming too focused upon them, serves as competition to pursuing first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Okay? So Jesus says we should watch out for that. To not let the focus of our life be the pursuit, the raw desire for earthly gain. Now the second threat that comfort and success and attainment comes through, comes through an anxiousness about material goods. So, yes, you can lose focus on seeking first the kingdom of God through a misguided, raw desire for comfort and, good, and goods. On the other hand, you can lose your focus on seeking first the kingdom of God through distracting, distracting worry about possessions. Persistently throughout this passage here, Jesus speaks of this danger. Notice just a number of times that he does this here. There in verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Then down in verse 28, Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Down in verse 31, He says it again. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? And then again, the last time there in verse 34. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And so Jesus is saying, look guys, I know that you can lose your focus on seeking first my kingdom and my righteousness through distracted anxiety. And remember the items that Jesus names here. These are things that we tend to get anxious about. Material things like food, like clothing. Now clearly here, Jesus doesn't mean for us to think that food and clothing are unimportant. That's not His point. Nor nor does Jesus deny or despise the fact that our bodies need food and need drink and we need clothing and shelter. As a matter of fact, Jesus earlier in chapter 6, a part of what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer, He says there to pray to the Father, give us this day our daily bread. So there's nothing wrong in asking for the food and the drink. That's not His point. But rather there, he says in verse 32, For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. So his point is, look, the Gentiles seek after it. They're they're anxious about it. That's why their life exists, is to pursue those things. You don't have to do that because you have a Father who knows that you need them, and He will provide for you. That God who accomplishes those things not by human power, human strength, but by His own Spirit. So Jesus isn't just saying that these goods, food, clothing, all those possessions don't matter, right? That's not His point. 
He, on the other hand, knows that these things can so occupy us, either because we are worried that we want to get them, or we are worried we won't have the right kind of food or the right kind of drink or the right kind of clothing. He knows that these things can become a preoccupation in our minds. And so he instructs us there in verse 26. He says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And then in verse 30, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Jesus reminds us that God is our Father and that he knows what we need. And if he is faithful to provide for the birds of the air, if he is faithful to provide for the grass of the field, and we are much more value than a pile of hay, or a couple of birds flying around, will our Father not help us? You see, God's care and provision are promised to us. And so Jesus tells us there is no need for us to be anxious about those things. And so both of these attitudes can threaten our focus on seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. We can be distracted by simple raw desire for laying up treasures here on the earth. And we can be distracted by an anxious worry about grabbing those things. Two different dynamics that take place in our own hearts. But the result of them are both the same. They draw our focus away from where it should be. So Jesus says, Christian, here is to be your life's focus. Seek first the kingdom of God and live your life pursuing that kingdom. Now, that's the warning. That's the competitor that exists, pursuing our own comfort. But what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? We've talked a little bit about what it doesn't mean, right? It, it doesn't mean that God's first on our priorities list. It means that everything in our life is to be done with the focus of how does this seek and pursue God's kingdom? That's what we're after. But you say, Seth, that, that really doesn't explain examples of what does it mean? What does it look like to seek God's kingdom? Because again, seeking something in pursue, indicates an activity, not some passive approach. There is, there is a being purposeful to accomplish something. It's an active task that we're called to. And so seeking God's kingdom is the desire for God's rule over everything. That's really what it means. To seek God's kingdom means to desire and promote God's rule over everything. And so we're structuring everything in our life to serve that end. Okay? So this idea of desiring and promoting God's rule in everything is to be the controlling focus of our lives. Again, this is what Jesus indicated in the Lord's Prayer. Right? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, rule here on earth as you do on earth, uh, in heaven. And so to seek His kingdom is to desire that His will to be done everywhere, in our lives, in the lives of everyone we know, in all the world, and we're aiming to do that in our own hearts, in our own lives, but we want to see that happen in others as well. And we want His will to come because we love God's will. We want God's perfect, wonderful reign to be the focus of our lives. We want God being God, and we want to be content and enjoying God being God. So, a little test here that maybe will help you think through this, right? I use myself as an example. The fact that I'm responsible as a Christian to steward my money. So I get paid, thank you for that, twice a month. Money is deposited into my bank account. And then I have the responsibility to steward that in a way that reflects a desire to promote the rule of God in everything. 
And so some of that is explicitly taught in Scripture. And so I'm instructed from the Bible by God to systematically and faithfully give out of my pay to advance the gospel, which we as a family do, and we count it as a privilege to do so. And then a significant part of what I make is is used to provide food and clothing and shelter for my family, which is a responsibility that we as Christians have to do. But now what? what? What about the rest that exists? Am I just sort of free to do with that money as I please, having fulfilled my priorities and obligations to God first through the explicit teaching of what God requires? And of course, the answer is no to that. I am called to steward what's left over in a way that reflects my focus. With my eye towards what is most kingdom strengthening, kingdom advancing, and kingdom honoring way that we can do that. Or for exact, the fact we could use the example of the church, the community of believers, the fact that I'm part of a worshiping, fellowshipping community of believers called Grace Life Church. Am I engaging with that community with the aim to strengthen God's kingdom with a desire to see God's rule over everything happen? And again, we can take this and apply it to every scenario. Are you approaching your work that way? Are you approaching the relationships that you're seeking? Are you actively pursuing God's reign over everything in that? That the way you approach it honors the Lord. And so maybe it would be helpful for us, I think it would be, to routinely do some inventory on our own hearts and our own lives. To think about your life and all of its parts, your wealth, your church, your work, your work, your relationships, your eating and drinking, your leisure, your entertainment, your reading, your care for your own body, and even your attitude toward the government. Is every part of your life, in every way that you're interacting in those spheres of influence and activity, are you saying, I want to act in this sphere in such a way that it is clear my desire here is to promote God's rule over everything? Is that principle part of your life and is it captured by in, in, in every area that God has called you to be involved? Or are you aware of some area that is not under the control of this call of Christ? Let me get a little more personal here. Let's move a little closer. We've, we've not had this through the, the last couple of weeks. Some of you here this morning may be sitting there thinking, you know what, Seth? I'm doing the best I can. You're doing your work for God, the work that God has put before you. And you're trying to be faithful to that work, those responsibilities, day by day. Things don't always end up the way that you would like them to, but you are faithfully doing the best you can. And maybe you can often feel like you're not a super Christian, right? Your life is ordinary. And in your ordinary life, you are trying to live for God, but it seems that your life is mundane, It's far from a radical life that's seeking first the kingdom of God. Well, I want to encourage you this morning that I have it on good authority that God is pleased, so pleased, with mundane, ordinary, ho-hum, faithful lives. I love this passage in 1 Timothy 2, verse 2. In that passage, Paul is instructing a young pastor by the name of Timothy that they ought to pray for rulers and people in authority so that they would make good decisions and rule in such a way that would lead to peace. So that, Paul says, we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Do you see that? Pray for peace that we could live peace peaceful, and a quiet life. And then he goes on to say, this is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Brothers and sisters, God is pleased 
with your simple daily faithfulness that is presented to Him. God is so pleased with quiet faithfulness. And we need to hear that because I think some people with good intentions, but nonetheless wrong intent, wrong, wrong outcome here, have sort of presented that seeking first the kingdom of God has to be this radical way of living. you got to do big things for God. And if you're not doing those things, you somehow, well, God's just really not really pleased with you because you're not seeking first the kingdom the way these other people are. And while those people mean well, and while some of those books get published, it's simply not true. God hasn't called, uh, called us to change the world. All these big ideas that's often presented, and then people, we can't, we, we can't do all those things. I can't tell you how many emails I get in a week of some group trying to get me to do something. There's wells to be dug in Africa. There's orphanages to be sponsored across the world. We need to be involved in Washington. We need to be doing this, and we need to be doing that, and we need to be doing this. And if we're not, and of course, basically all those emails tell me if I'm not doing that, well, I'm not seeking first the kingdom of God. Now, I know those people are foolish. But I think about how many Christians are bombarded with these types of agendas and causes to get involved in and are made to feel like they're not seeking first kingdom because they're not launching onto that ministry to help financially support what they're trying to do. If it didn't waste time, I want to email these people that email me about, well, you need to be doing this, or you're a worthless Christian. I want to send them all the other emails I get from all these other different groups and say, hey, are you digging a well in Africa? What orphanage are you sponsoring in over there? Oh, no, you're just focused on this one little agenda that you're about. And that's not possible to live and do all the things that people tell us that we ought to do. We don't need a pastor or anyone else telling us things outside the Scripture that we ought to be doing. Now, there, those things might be good for some to do. And I'm thankful that there are some that dig wells in Africa. I'm not against that. Please don't. Email me telling me about that, okay? I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do. I'm just, I don't, God's not put that before me to do. And I'm not going to allow my conscience to be manipulated by somebody to do something God hasn't called me to do. You see, a focused Christian life on God's rule over everything doesn't mean that you have to go into full-time ministry or that you have to attend four different Bible studies or you have to adopt orphans or you have to drill for water in Africa. There, it is humanly impossible to do all the things that people would tell us that we ought to do. So the notion that seeking first the kingdom of God is being a missionary or leading Bible studies or fill in the blank with whatever things someone's approaching you with. Now I want to be clear, all of those things are good and God-honoring things to do. It's just we can't make an equation between doing those things and that means seeking first the kingdom of God. Seeking first the kingdom of God does not equal doing whatever someone tells you to do. God might be calling you to do that, and so therefore you ought to pursue it if that's what God's put before you. But make sure it's God who's put it before you and not some well-meaning Christian that's trying to get you involved in some, or sometimes not a well-meaning person, that's trying to get you involved in something that God has excited them about. Seeking first God's kingdom is faithfully doing what God has set before you to do with a purpose to see God's rule in the doing of it. And God is going to set before each of us different things that we ought to do. Okay? All right? So, for instance, God has set before me to be a pastor. I know that. But I don't go around trying to make everyone say, well, you need to be a pastor if you're going to seek first the kingdom of God. You need to do this. It's the same way, right? We have different gifts that God has given us in the church, and oftentimes I've seen this happen, that people can pursue a certain gift that God's given them, and they can get frustrated with other people because they don't pursue that same thing. It's like if you were really serious about God, you'd be just like me doing this. And that's simply not true, right? That's what God's put before you to do. We're glad you're excited about it. We want to help you do that in any way we can to up to a point, but we can't all do all those things. That's why there's different gifts in the body. Different gifts given to the church. 
And so sometimes we elevate the pastor or we elevate the missionary. And there can be a sense that that's really what seeking first the kingdom of God looks like, not leading the quiet, faithful life, doing faithfully what God's put before you to do. So pastors don't have an inside track. Those who are dwelling wells in Africa don't have an inside track. Those who run orphanages don't have an inside track. We are all equally called to seek first the kingdom of God by faithfully and purposefully doing whatever God has put before us to do in every part of our lives and doing all of it in a way that honors and promotes the rule of God. And most of the time, Hear that. Most times this takes the form of a quiet, steady, faithful life. And many people in this church are doing exactly that. And I cannot tell you how pleased God is with your quiet and faithful life that you're living to pursue everything under the rule of God. And it is good for you, and I hope that you can trust in this knowledge that you are living in the good pleasure of God over it. On the other hand, maybe some of us have allowed a desire for material goods or an anxiety about those material goods to distract us from having our priority on pursuing God's kingdom, His rule over everything and everything else in our lives serving that purpose. And if that's where you're at, then you need to repent. And you need to readjust your focus. I have felt that bit in my own life, in that category here recently. And I've needed realignment, and I'm thankful for God's help in helping me along to regain focus on His rule over everything. And I can imagine there are others perhaps here in this room or watching with us on our live stream that you, maybe if you're honest with yourself, you've gotten way off. These distractions have taken you far away from seeking first God's rule in everything. And friend, if that is the case where you're at this morning, I want to tell you that the Bible is so wonderfully encouraging in a call to repentance. When we acknowledge where we have gotten wrong, when we call out to God and say, Lord, I've blown it. My focus has been on me and my uh, uh, gathering things for myself. I'm living as though this world is all there is. And I've neglected seeking first your kingdom because I've been too busy building my own and trying to use you, God, and others to accomplish my agenda. There is forgiveness when we ask for it. There is restoration, there is healing, there is hope, there is the promise of a fresh start, there's a a cure for this sickness, and there is strength from God to take the path ahead of seeking first the kingdom of God. Listen, God is so good to us. God is so good to us in Christ to connect us to His plan of making His greatness known across the world, and He has called and given us this life and called us to say, look, join me in this big picture that I'm about of making my rule and my reign known throughout the entire world. And this morning, if you have put your faith in Christ, I want you to take a moment and just remind yourself to think back to the time when you put your your trust in Christ, when you started believing in Him. That's at that moment when God rescued you, when He gave you new life in Christ, and you've been a Christian ever since that moment. And God has connected in that moment, He has connected us to Himself. He has drawn us into the only thing that will be standing when all of this world has ended. And that is His kingdom. Not the treasures that people have laid up, Not all the golden Fort Knox, all of that will be destroyed. All that this world longs for and sells their soul for will be nothing at the end. And the only thing standing will be God's kingdom and a triumphant king with a people that he has brought to himself through the proclamation of the death of his son and his resurrection from the dead. 
And when we enter into eternity, we will be so glad, so joyful, glad for this privilege that we've had to actually live our lives on this earth for His kingdom, glad for Christ's mercy that covers our weaknesses when our focus does get off, but also glad for His enabling strength that we could actually live for this, His kingdom, and not be condemned to just a brief, shallow life here on the earth, gathering around treasures on the Titanic while it's sinking in the water. That's foolish. God has saved us from that. And so we are able to seek His kingdom, to seek His and promote His rule over everything through every aspect of our life. And at the end of the day, we will be able to enjoy His kingdom under His rule forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. We thank You for Your kindness to invite us into Your kingdom. Father, what a privilege to know that we are citizens of the greatest government that can ever be thought of with you as king. And Father, I pray that you would help us to order our lives, to organize our lives around this this focus of making every aspect of our life promote your rule, your reign. And Father, what a, what a blessed kingdom to be a part of. That, that your rule and your reign is not oppressive. It, it, it's not an attempt to, to kill joy and, and life. Lord, you're protecting us from wasting our lives and investing our lives in bad investments. Father, help us to be a, a kingdom-minded congregation. And Father, I pray that we would, we would understand that, that your rule and everything isn't, isn't a call to some radical life. Though it is radical in, in the eyes of the world to simply be content to do the simple task that you put before us each day and to know that's how you promote your kingdom in this world. And when we are committed to it, we live and we walk with your smile upon our lives. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.